All right, so in this problem we have this conveyor belt, and the conveyor belt has these rollers that are rotating, and it's moving the top of this belt with a constant speed v. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to place a block of ice onto the belt. Now the block of ice is slippery. It's not completely frictionless, but it's slippery, okay? So I'm going to put the block of ice on the belt. It's initially going to have zero speed. So what's going to happen is this block is going to slowly build up speed, and by the time it reaches the end of the belt, before it reaches this point A here, the block is going to, at least at some point, gain speed so that it matches the speed of the belt. Now the first thing we're asked to do in this problem is to draw a free body diagram of the block. If you haven't done it yet, pause the video and do it now. All right, so let's start drawing the block. Here's the, uh, the block, there's the ice, and the free body diagram, of course, uh, depicts all the forces acting on this body. So I have weight acting downward, and on free body diagrams I like to label my forces, so there's weight indicated as a vector. What else do I have? I have a normal force pushing up. What's the normal force? The normal force is the force on the, of the belt acting on the block, right? The belt is pushing the block upward so that the block does not fall through the belt. So I'll label that normal force N. And then I have one more force, right? The friction. The friction force is tangent to the belt. It's either pushing or pulling on the bottom surface of the block, right? Now a question I have up here is, which direction does that friction force act? Does it pull the block to the left? Does it push the block to the right? Or, I guess, I left open the idea that there is no friction force also. So I'll tell you the usual answer I get from students. That is, students usually say that my friction force is a force that pulls on this block to the left, like so. Is that what you would say? The rationale I get is usually something like this. You place this block of ice on the belt, and the block of ice starts chugging along, moving to the right. And friction opposes motion, right? Friction always opposes the motion, so therefore friction should be pushing to the left. Now, if this is the way you were thinking, let me say, hold on a second. Let's think about this. First of all, are there any other forces acting on this block of ice? Remember, forces are things that are actually pushing and pulling on the block. The weight certainly pushing or pulling. The conveyor belt itself is pushing back up so that the block doesn't fall through the conveyor belt. And the conveyor belt also has some friction. There's friction pushing and pulling on that block. That friction force is coming from the belt acting on the block, and there's nothing else in contact with the block, is there? There are no other forces. And we just said just a moment ago that if you place this block of ice on the belt, what's going to happen? We just said that this block of ice is going to start moving this way, right? It starts off perfectly stationary, and then it starts picking up a velocity, picking up a speed towards the right. So if it starts off with zero speed and its speed starts increasing towards the right, what does that mean? That means this block has acceleration to the right. Now Newton's second law says if we have acceleration to the right, then we must have a net force to the right. Well, weight is not going to produce a net force to the right. Yeah, weight acts straight down. This normal force coming from the belt, that's not going to push the block to the left or the right. That's pushing perpendicular to the belt, or normal to the belt. The only thing that can push the block to the left or to the right is the friction. Since I have acceleration to the right, I must have a net force to the right. In other words, I must have friction to the right. So let's get rid of this. Friction force doesn't belong there. That friction force is to the right. Now if this doesn't make intuitive sense to you, I'm going to ask you to go through one more little experiment here. So what I have here is not a conveyor belt, but rather a belt sander. And instead of a, a block of ice, I have a block of wood. Now in a moment, I'm going to turn on the sander, and I'm going to set that block of wood on that sanding belt. And you can imagine what's going to happen, right? Now that friction force is the force of the belt scraping against the bottom of the block. As I hold the block onto that belt, I can feel that friction force just pull on it, just tug on it. And finally, when I let go of that block, you can see what happens. It gets pulled to the right. Friction is to the right. And if you're not feeling it yet, why don't you imagine placing your fingers on that belt sander? Don't actually do it, please. Just imagine putting it on there. Which way would that belt tug on your fingers? You'd feel it tugging to the right in that picture you're looking at, right? That's the force of friction. Friction is pulling to the right. 
All right, so now that I have my free body diagram working with my friction pointed in the correct direction, now the next object of business is to go and uh, do some plotting. So what I want to do is sketch a plot of position that's in what I'm calling S. S is a displacement of this block along the belt as a function of time, and I have some axes here in which I can draw that. In addition to that, I'm going to want S dot, or the time derivative of S, or component of velocity. And finally, S double dot, second time derivative, or the horizontal component of acceleration. And I've got uh, plot axes for all these things here. So obvious question that arises is, which one do I plot first? Well, students often say, well, uh, I kind of understand what the position's going to do, so let me plot that one first. So I have a gut feeling for how the velocity is going to look, so let me do that one next. I strongly urge you not to do that, because although you may have a gut feeling what the position and the velocity should be, you don't know those direct. What do you know about this problem directly? Well, the thing you know is this stuff on the free body diagram right here. What you know are the forces acting on the body. In particular, we have, we're looking for the horizontal motion of this thing. So the horizontal motion of this thing is related to the horizontal force. The horizontal force is friction. We know about the friction. If we know about the friction, we can use Newton's second law to determine what the acceleration should be. Then, once we know acceleration, we can integrate to get velocity integrate that to get position. All right, so let's go with this friction force and the acceleration. Before we do, let me ask you one quick question about that friction. My question is, the friction, is that kinetic or static, or at least initially? Remember when I set the block of ice onto the belt, what's going on? Kinetic or static friction? Now you might be tempted to say kinetic friction just because the block starts moving, right? Well, that's not really the reason why. It is kinetic friction, by the way. But the reason it's kinetic friction is because the block is sliding. It's sliding on the belt, right? Remember the belt is scraping the bottom of that block. So because the two things are moving relative to each other, the belt is moving faster than the block, we've got kinetic friction. And when we have kinetic friction, we know, at least according to our Coulomb model, that friction force has magnitude equal to mu k times the magnitude of the normal force. Why is that important? Because we want to plot acceleration and we need to know what sort of friction force I have. According to the kinetic friction model, the magnitude of that friction is just mu k times the magnitude of the normal force. And what's the no magnitude of the normal force? Well, we see there's only two vertical forces acting in the body, right? And the block is accelerating horizontally. It's not accelerating vertically. So therefore, these two vertical forces have to cancel each other out exactly. So the normal force, or the magnitude of that normal force, has to equal the magnitude of the weight. And guess what? The block isn't changing its mass. Let's assume the, I guess the block of ice is not melting at all, not melting very quickly. So it's not changing its mass, so it's constant. So therefore, friction force has to be a constant, a constant force to the right. And of course, there's a caveat here, right? This is when we have kinetic friction. So this is only true while the block is sliding on the belt. All right, so now let's go to my plots here. Remember, I'm going to do acceleration first. I'm doing acceleration because I know about the friction force. And then according to Newton's second law, Newton's second law tells me the sum of all my forces on my body equals mass times acceleration. So this is going to be mass times S double dot in that I hat direction. And since that friction force is a constant and the positive direction. Therefore, my acceleration must be a positive constant as well. And then this is only true for sliding, right? Only true for sliding. So I'm thinking of getting a positive constant acceleration like so. Now you'll notice I only drew this acceleration uh, part way. I didn't go all the way a long time. Because this only is valid while I'm sliding. I know I'm sliding at the very beginning, maybe not at the very end. So let me just go along with this for a while, not draw it the whole way. So if we have a constant positive acceleration or constant positive s double dot, what does s single dot mean? First derivative of s. Well, it's just the integral of this thing. Remember the block started off with zero velocity. It started off at rest. So I know initially I have a s dot here at zero. Now if s double dot is just a positive constant, then s dot should be something that grows linearly in time, something like this, right? Now you recall in the problem statement, oops, I don't have it written down there, but I stated that sometime before the block gets to the end of the belt, or at least gets to point A over here, the block is going to match the speed of the belt, and we can see that right here, right? The speed grows linearly, and then boom, right at this instant right here, 
the speed matches the speed of the belt. This is this is speed V right here. Now when the block stops sliding, this is very important to us, right? Because all of a sudden, we no longer have the kinetic friction anymore. All of a sudden, this analysis we did no longer holds. So everything we've written here is only good up until this point right there and that point right there. As soon as we reach this point, as soon as the block matches the speed of the belt, now we have static friction. And what is the force due to static friction? Static friction is not some mu s times n, right? The force of static friction is whatever is necessary to keep the block from sliding. As long as it doesn't go get too big, static friction is whatever is required to keep the block from sliding. Well, how much force is required to keep the block from sliding? Well, in this problem, it's kind of trivial, I think. Check out this. Let's suppose this friction force drops to zero. If the friction force drops to zero, then the acceleration is zero, right? So, hmm. so friction force equals zero means zero acceleration. So my acceleration just jumped down to zero. If my acceleration is zero, what does that mean about velocity? Velocity is constant. Well, velocity is already at the belt speed, belt velocity if you like. So if the force drops down to zero, the velocity is going to stay at the belt speed, which means they're going to keep on matching, right? The velocity matches the belt, then we're not sliding. It stays sliding. So a force of zero is what is required to keep the block from sliding. So boom, there's my, there's my velocity. And it's kind of cool. We can see that block of ice just slipping for a while. It's slowly picking up speed until the speed of the block matches the speed of the belt. That's when it sticks there and just rides the belt to the end of the, to the, end of the line. Now the only thing left to do is plot position as a function of time. That's the last thing we're doing, right? Might have thought that would have been the first thing. It's actually the last thing we're doing because we did acceleration, velocity. Now integrate one more time to get position. The block starts off at s equals zero, so I'm going to start right there. Notice that my velocity is initially zero, so initially this thing has zero slope, so it's going to come off like so. The slope is going to start increasing, right? So it comes off parabolically, actually. So let me do a very gentle par parabola here, like so. It's supposed to be parabola. And then after that parabola, after this linear velocity, then I get a constant velocity. If I've got a constant velocity, then I've got a constant slope in, in the position. So this is how I finish this sucker off right there. Try to continue that, that curve up continuously like that. So there's my position curve. That's at least the best I can do oh, by hand. All right, and that does it. Done.